So I, we're, let me get it right. <laughs> we are thankful for the opportunity to come back to this place so we can finish up on our lesson on the tree of life. Uh, we find that in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. We also find it in Revelation 22 and verse number 2. It's also in another chapter in Revelation to chapter number 2. But let's start off to today in Luke 13 and verse number 18. Now, the kingdom of God, uh, Jesus said it came without observation. There wasn't uh, a man on a white charger with a gold crown on his head riding through the streets with an army behind him and banners flowing and trumpets blasting and saying, okay, this is the new king and this is going to be the new kingdom. This didn't come with that. It came without observation. It came by the Holy Spirit uh, redeeming people and changing them from, from dark to daylight and making new creatures out of them. That's what... That's what matters is a new creature. So we look in Luke chapter 13 and verse 18, and we ask the king, unto what is the kingdom of God like? Ask the king himself. Then said he, unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? Right. We want to hear the answer to that question, Lord. What is the kingdom of God like, and how shall you resemble it? There's things that are already in the world that are prepared to reveal to you what the kingdom of God is like. And, and we read that and have read it time and time again in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. For the invisible things of him, like the kingdom of God, that comes without observation. The invisible things of him... By and from and because of the king, the creation of the world, we can clearly see them because those invisible things are understood by the things that are made. So, Lord, take something that's made and show us the invisible kingdom of God. Okay, Luke 13, 18. Then said he, Unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? Answer, Luke 13, 19. It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast it into his garden. And it grew and waxed a great, what? Tree. And the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. What's the kingdom of God like? It's like a little bitty seed that turns into a great big tree and the birds of the air are able to lodge in it. That's what God said it was like. It's like a tree. The kingdom of heaven is like a tree. The tree of life. The Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man. It says in Psalm 1. Uh, he, he said that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So we see these trees that we are looking at, and we looked at one last week, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this week we're looking at the tree of life. And it, it says that that tree of life is going to be in the garden of God in Genesis chapter 2, what is it, verse 7? Not Genesis 2, 8, and 9, but in Revelation, that's what I was thinking about, Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 7, it's not going to go away. Revelation 2, 7. And I mean, here it is. He that hath an ear, do you have a spiritual inner ear? Can you hear the spirit of the, the word? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The, the revelation of the inspiration of the truth of God. Here it is. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So he that is 
has conquered, he that has overcome, he that hath endured to the end, the same shall be saved. Did you decide you'd had enough? You tried Christianity and found it to be too hard and you quit? Or is it not Christianity and a way of life, a religious way of life to you? But is it Christianity is the love that you have for the Lord Jesus Christ and the love he has placed in your heart for you. You say, I can't quit that which won't quit me. He never quit me. I can't quit him. Okay. If you continue that and you continue and overcome all the trials and heartaches and uh, temptations and everything that's in this life and you, and you stay true to the end, Jesus said, I am going to give you to eat, not just to see, but to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, the thief said. Jesus said, thus, today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. What's in the middle of that? Tree of life. The man endured to the end. He overcame. And if you will be an overcomer, God will reintroduce you. That really ain't right. God has already introduced all those who are born again to the tree of life. I don't want to think that this is only something that can happen when you die and go to heaven. If you are living uh, in a brightful relationship with Jesus Christ, now you are feasting off the tree of life. But this is what he's saying uh, to this church in Revelation 2, 7. He that overcometh, he that conquers with me. I came forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation chapter 6, we see him on that white charger. He said, and the army was behind me on white horses. If you are following the lamb whithersoever he goeth, if you are on your white chargers, he's on his. You, you, you are imitating that which he is and does then he says, I will bring you back into the right relationship with the tree of life, and my Father and me and the Holy Spirit will never, ever say again, we got to get them out of here. we got to get them away from that tree of life, lest they eat and do what? Live forever. That's what I want them to do. That's what they have been doing. That's what I introduced them to in John chapter 6. Eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Not literally, but yes, literally spiritual. I have been feasting off of Christ, you say. I have been drinking his blood. He has been empowering me. What does that mean? It means that I am cast upon Christ like the infant is cast upon his mother's body. Uh, and, and, and that infant, uh, that word soul, that new... Uh, that new being uh, is, a, is an appetite. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. It shall be filled. You will have that which entertains your appetite and that which uh, satisfies your appetite. You will have Christ no matter what anybody else does, whether all hell comes against you or not. They cannot stop you from having an appetite for the Lord Jesus Christ. They cannot cease uh, for you to have eternal life. It cannot be done. This is the way that it is. And Lord, what is the kingdom of God like? It's like a tree. Luke chapter 13, verse 19. It's the tree of life. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 4. And uh, it, it's like uh, the, the blessed man is like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. And that tree in uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 18 and 19, it, it, it gives, uh, it gives uh, opportunity for birds of the air to be able to roost there and to live there. And uh, we find that that was exactly the way it was uh, in Daniel chapter 4. For, for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. In, in verse number 9. is where it begins. 
verse number eight, here's uh, Belteshazzar, that is Daniel, coming and his uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is being told. He's telling you the account of his dream. Daniel 4, verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar. That means Bel's prince, as it was named after the Babylonians. Uh, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told my dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dreams that I have seen, and the interpretations thereof. Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw, and behold, guess what? A tree. This is what God had that king dreaming about. Dear, dear soul, listen, in ancient Babylon, we're not talking about archaeologists in our day and digging up stuff that was centuries old and trying to find out something about this or that or the other. This is God giving Bel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar a dream in Nebuchadnezzar's day, and he made him dream about a tree. And it's right here in your Bible for you to see it to sustain you. Tree of life in Genesis 2. Tree of life in Genesis 22. Uh, blessed man like a tree planted by the rivers of water in Psalm chapter 1. But then right here in Daniel chapter 4, another tree. God just keeps bringing up these trees. And he says, I saw and behold a tree uh, in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. And the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof was much, and it was meat or food for all. Don't that sound like the tree of life? In Revelation 22, on the east side of the river of life, listen, the beast of the field had shadow under it. That's what Jesus said in Luke 13, verses 18 and 19. What's the kingdom like? It's like a little bitty mustard seed growing into a great tree, and all the birds of the air can rest in it and build their nest there and can be sustained there and can be shaded from the hot sun there. Listen. All the beasts of the field had shatter under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. Isn't that something? I saw in my visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said, Cut that tree down. Hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit, let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. I get in a dry throat. Wait a minute. Nevertheless, leave the stump and his roots in the earth, even with a, a, a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the grass of the earth. And it goes on and on and on and on. So when Daniel begins to in interpret this thing, he says in verse 20, the tree that thou sawest, which was great and which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven and the sight thereof of the earth, he drops down in verse 22, it said, It is thou, O king. Nebuchadnezzar was the tree. It was compared to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was compared to it. Man like a tree all down through the scriptures. It's constantly there. So the tree of life is the man of life, the person of the God-man, Jesus Christ. So we understand and see that our forefathers, F-O-R-E, not F-O-U-R, our forefathers had a, a, a diet that was satisfied and suited by trees. At first, it didn't say that 
God planted any vegetables. It just said eat off these trees. People just walking around in the, Adam and Eve walking around in that forest, that beautiful garden of Eden, and if they got hungry, they picked something off of a tree. That's the way it was. It was later under the curse that Adam began to dig into the ground and plant and to harvest. That's when he got thorns and briars. All right. So in their innocency, I hate to use that word, but anyhow, it's the best word that's suited for it. Before they sinned, they ate off of trees solely, completely, entirely. After sin shall be no more, all mankind shall be in the paradise of God, and they shall again eat off of trees, eat off of, tr of a tree. What tree is it? The tree of life. Are you talking about a physical tree? Not necessarily, but probably. But that's not what you're supposed to see, and that's, what not, that's not what you're supposed to taste. That's not all we're talking about. He just adapted trees, as in Romans 1.20, so that with this natural thing, we might see the invisible things of God. So we're going to be brought from before sin, eating off of trees completely, entirely, only, to after sin, and when glory has come and we shall be changed into the likeness of, of his glorious body, Philippians 3.20, I remember now. Then we shall again be eating off of the tree of life. But isn't that what we're doing now if you're a Christian? Yep. Or else John 6 doesn't have any meaning. We took the time, I know, I kept going away from it and getting back to it because there's just so many thoughts come to you when you read that passage. And that's the only way you can interpret it by the, uh, by the impressions God gives you concerning uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. So we, we, we have already gone back as Christians. You may not realize it. You may not see it this way yet. You may not understand. You may not comprehend it yet as your faith is that which is the appetite to feast off of God and to believe in Him. But it is. You are living in the realm of spiritual consciousness. And you are living, being nourished by the invisible things of God. And the Bible says things like this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, you can't just, like, grab an apple and bite into it. That's not what it's talking about. But, boy, that apple is good, isn't it? Some of them are kind of tart, and some of them are kind of sweet. Some of them are soft-meated, and some of them are hard. They're good. But that's just to give you an understanding of how delightful God is and taste and see that the Lord is good. What do you think was meant by them being able to have a portion of their sacrifices for the priest's meal? That priest was to take that <clears throat> meat that was brought in and put it in a cauldron, a big pot of water, and boil it. And for his family's supper, he would take a three-pronged hook and stick it in there, and once it was tender enough, he could pull that prong, that, that hook out, and it, uh, enough meat would come with it to feed him and his family. They were actually eating the sacrifices that the other Israelites were giving for their atonement. Don't you see it? How can we not see it? He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood. 
certain sacrifices were meant to be given for the priest to eat and feed his family. It was the exact same piece of meat, portion of that animal that was offered to God. Let me put something else on your brain. Do you ever remember reading the account of the Last Supper? By the way, it's not called the Last Dinner. So the evening meal is supper time. I don't care what you say. I got it. I got you. All right. Forget that. As they were eating the Last Supper, you remember reading that passage of Scripture? It says, and as they were eating, he took bread and blessed it and break it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Wait a minute. Was that the rolls in in that tray? Was that the dinner rolls that they had just been eating? Yep. Maybe that was one of the kind of rolls that Jesus used to dip in the sop and hand to Judas. Well, don't get too common with it. Well, think about it. As they were eating, he took bread. Now then, it's the same bread that they were eating for supper. And he says, he blessed it. Now that's what's made the difference. He blessed it and broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Those commonalities, and I use that word very carefully. Because there ain't nothing common about God and his glory, and especially about the cross of Christ. But they were eating that bread before. In those commonalities, that which distinguished it and set it apart was, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he passed it out. That made the difference. So we understand and see, dear soul, that if I am... Since we are going to eat and feast off Christ in eternal glory, the tree of life is going to be there, and Christ is the tree of life, then that's offered to those who overcome. And it's been here all the time. Because your soul must eat. Eat, your soul shall live. It's, it's God granting, granting you himself today for you to feast off of him. How did you make it thus far in this day? God sustained me. How? By giving me hunger and thirst for righteousness. So whether you knew it or not, whether you heard the crunch of the apple or not, whether you realize the hunger pain in your soul or not, you have been feasting off of the Lord Jesus Christ ever since God quickened you and birthed you from above. That's just going to go on. And John chapter 6 is misunderstood, or rather not understood, It's not just misapplied. They just don't know what to do with it. Because the realization of our souls being an appetite and feasting off Christ is foreign to us. But it's the tree of life all through this Bible wherein we're able to partake. And he says, and you must realize this in Genesis 3.22, it is so important. We must get them away from the tree of life now that they have partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They've fallen into sin lest they should eat and live forever. The tree of life, when you eat off of it, will cause you to live forever. Do you have eternal life? Well, John 3.16 says I do. Okay, hang on to that. That's good. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, then if you have eternal life, you must have eternal nourishment. 
And if you have eternal nourishment, you must have a spiritual digestive tract wherein you are able to have the Holy Spirit appropriate to you the bread of life, who is Jesus Christ. You say, I don't understand it. I don't either. Well, quit throwing it away because you don't understand it. There's a lot of things you don't understand that you don't, you don't have, you don't throw them away. I get in my car and I turn that key and we go. I don't know how all that works. You click that clicker and it turns on the TV, so it, and you tell me you understand how that signal comes into your house that is the exact same signal in everybody's house in the whole world if they are t attuned on that same frequency to that same channel. I don't know. But am I going to throw them away and not use No. Nope. How in the world are you feasting off Christ right now? How am I fe feasting off Christ right now? I don't know. But John 6 tells me that I am. And Jesus told me in Luke 13, 18, and 19 that the kingdom is like a tree. And Psalm chapter 1, not chapter, there are no chapters in Psalms. They're just the first Psalm. It's like a song book. Psalm 1 says, The blessed man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And his leaf don't wither and he shall prosper. So that tree is that which is supplying me and sustaining me with eternal nourishment. God has not left you alone. Another one that was brought up to me earlier before this message, John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. The vine has the root. The branches have the fruit. Where do the branches get the fruit? It comes up through the vine. What kind of fruit do they produce? Whatever kind of vine it is. If, if, if the vine, listen, is, 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 is a briar bush, it ain't going to have grapes. The only reason it has grapes is because it's a grape vine. Why do you have righteousness? Because Christ is your righteousness. He is the vine and you are the branches. He is the root that draws life from God the Father. As the Father liveth, uh, in me, I live in him. Isn't that what it said? That was so glorious in verse 57 of John chapter 6. As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father. As I live by the Father, so he that leadeth me, even he shall live by me. And what you need to do, if you need to, get along with God. Or at least get in some quiet place where you can think and meditate. And the first thing you do is ask God to help you. You close your eyes because you want to shut out everything else. It's not necessary to close your eyes unless you're distracted if, if you leave them open. But he says, as I live by the Father. Okay. Statement. Established. I live by the Father. Got it? Yeah. All right. But it didn't just say, I live by the Father. It said, in the way that I live by the Father. As I live by the Father. Okay? This is going to tell you how he does it. As I live by the Father. Then, then the conclusion, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. As I live by the Father, even these shall live by me. But there was one other thing put in there. How do you live by him? By eating him. And this is a soul. In other words, this is drawn from the conclusion of how God the Father and God the Son are established as one life. How does the Son Live by the Father in the way that you live by me. How do you live by me? By eating me. Then I can say, I live by the Father by consuming him. This is a great verse. 
I hadn't plummeted the depth of it yet, and I doubt I ever will. I am going to learn a lot more when I get into eternal glory than what the Lord is showing me now because of my ignorance and my limited ability. He's got an ocean full of knowledge he wants to give me, and i got a little thimble to catch it all in. But I'm pouring it out all on you. You're going to get everything I get. And look at John 6, 57. As the living Father has sent me, and as I live by the living Father, even so, he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So you, you, you see that phrase, he that eateth me, as and so. You are just like me as you eat from me in the same way I eat from the Father. Even so, as. As this happens, so that happens. Well, how did this happen? You eat me and live by me. Then that's how that happened. God is revealing us, excuse me, God is revealing to us the nourishing relationship between the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't think I'm ready for that yet. I don't think we are, none of us are. But he gave it to us. And dear soul, he's not going to put anything on my plate that I don't chew on. It may get to be a mouthful, and it may be that I have to cut a smaller piece and it, 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 it may be, dear soul, that, that I can't get it all swallowed down. But I'm going to chew on it because he, the living bread, said, here's your food. Eat it. He said, but it chokes me. Then don't bite off so much. You don't need Dr. Bottle Stopper. You don't need to go to the Christian bookstore and try to get some self-helps. Think about life. Your mama made a roast beef. You cut off too big a piece and put it on your plate. You say, I can't eat it all. Well, we're going to cut it off and put it in the refrigerator and we'll save it for your supper. What's wrong with that? Well, I, I, I can't consume all of that. Well, take off what you can eat and save the rest till later. Listen, what are you going to be doing in eternity? Why are you in such a hurry? Why do you think you've got to get it all now? You don't. God is going to appropriate it to you according to your hunger and according to your ability to chew and swallow did you choke your child by cramming too much food in their mouth? Why, no. Did you not prepare the food to be fixed for them to swallow it down easy? You didn't give them an apple slice. You gave them apple sauce. The apple skin is removed. The peeling is removed. The apple itself is, the core is taken out. The stem is taken off. And you chop it up real fine, and you make sure that it's almost like water. And they swallow it down. Ta-da! Please don't say, because I can't appropriate God to me, I'm not going to try to feast off of him. Bad mistake. Bad mistake. You might be saying then that you don't have an appetite for God. You might be saying that I'm not a, one of those blessed that hunger and thirst. You say, oh, Brother Gene, don't say that. Okay. Then start eating. Well, it chokes me. Well, cut off a smaller piece. Well, it tastes different. Well, you need to change your taste buds and come to understand, as they say, this is an Acquired taste. 
you so there's no other way. It's either this way or eternal damnation. Now, which one do you want? How do we eat his flesh and drink his blood? We read you verses 45 uh, down through verses down to verse 57 of John chapter 6. The, the culmination, the conclusion was, you're going to live off of me the way I live off the Father. But there was something else said in that verse. Okay, I'm going to pass it on to you that you're going to live off of me in the same way that I live off the Father. And you say, well, how does that work? He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life. That's how I live off the Father, and that's how you live off of me. How do I think about Christ eating off the flesh of God? Very carefully, very reverently, very hungrily, asking the Lord to reveal to you how to appropriate Christ to you in the same way that the Father is appropriated to the Son. Now you're going to grow in grace. Now you're getting somewhere. Now they just attend these meetings and, you know, get baptized in this water and take this wafer and, you know, attend these services and do this and do that. No, th this is not just doing, this is being. I want to have Christ appropriated to me as the bread of life that I might live in the same way that I live, excuse me, in the same way that Christ lives off the Father. Say it. Say it. I want to have Christ appropriated to me in the same way that Christ has the Father appropriated to him. Say it. Believe it. That's the only way. You say, it's so far beyond me, I can't comfort. Did your baby have to give you the analogy of applesauce before you swallowed that down? Did its little grimy, you know, grinning gums have to grow teeth before it could eat that apple? You used to laugh and grin when you saw that baby grin and them, them gums with no teeth looked like Grandpa without his false teeth in his mouth. But they didn't have to be or do anything other than just receive what you gave them. What did you give them? You give them strained plums. Oh, they liked them. Strained green beans, not so much. But everything you gave them was appropriated by the condition that you gave it to them in. Jesus Christ has been giving you and feeding you himself. And he says, now, come here, I want to show you something. I am not doing for you anything that I didn't have to do for myself. What do you mean? You know how I've been feeding myself to you? Well, yeah, I don't understand it, but I know you've been doing it. Well, that's how the Father feeds himself to me. Glory, glory, glory. Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. He's showing you the Father, but I don't know that it suffices us all that much because we are scared of it and we're, we're afraid to believe it. We're afraid, afraid to trust it. Come on, Christian, don't you want to grow? He that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. They shall eat and live forever. And I won't have to put you out of the garden to separate you from the tree of life. I'm going to bring you into the Holy of Holies and show you the communion of the Son with the Father and how that he is appropriated to me by the Spirit and he becomes one with me 
and I drink down his pablum, I drink down his apples, applesauce, I receive him just as I am. This old, you are okay to receive Christ. He wouldn't put it in your mouth without teeth if you needed to chew it up. You need to receive God and say, I am fit for whatever way he appropriates himself to me. If it's strong meat, Hebrews chapter 5, then I have teeth. If it's milk, then I have an appetite. I have a clear passageway that I can swallow down and drink. But I'm going to only discern good and evil and have the ability to perceive and understand by the eating of strong meat. Isn't that what he said? I believe it is. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Hebrews 5, 14. But strong meat, is that what you want? Belongeth to them that are of full age, even though those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In the tree of life, you have the awareness of the tree of knowledge. You know what's good and evil. Your conscience either excusing or accusing you. But how do you get that? Well, I don't want to just keep on sucking down applesauce through these gums that have no teeth in them. I want to have the teeth to push through. And my, didn't that give that baby a hard time? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? They're cutting teeth. What do you mean cutting teeth? Those, those hard bones, that t the teeth are pushing through those soft gums. And it's hard. Yeah, but it's necessary and it's good. And teething won't last long. And mama will take something and rub it on your gums and it will feel so good and she will make sure that those gums are numbed and that you're able to complete this process. And before long, years later, you won't even remember that it happened. You just got teeth. The only thing you remember is I got to go to the dentist. Why did God give you teeth? Why did God give you bald gums? Why did you have to have oatmeal? Why did you have to have applesauce? Why is it now that you desire strong meat? It's because that's life progressing on. Well, what about your spiritual life? Aren't these things essential and necessary to show you the invisible things of God? Aren't they there for you to see how the Father appropriated himself to the Son, and as I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And that phrase, that eateth me, is the key to understanding the as. The as and the so are going to be the same. But the so gives you one more little phrase of understanding that you didn't have with the soul. Excuse me, that you didn't have with the as. Let me say it this way. That second part of that verse, John 6, 57, gives you some understanding of what you didn't see in the first part of that verse. So as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. As the living Father has sent me, and I eat him, and live by him, then if you eat me, you shall live by me. So he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life. And it's not talking about the natural. It requires the natural, Romans 1.20, to show you the supernatural. But it's talking about things that are heavenly. He told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, listen. You've asked me, earthly things and I can't tell you 
how in the world can I tell you heavenly things? You don't understand anything. I say, you must be born again. You say, I got to get back inside my mother's body and come out again. I can't talk to you. God is here striving to show you, desiring to show us spiritual things. I wonder if you will, if you will reward yourself in the near future by beginning to feast off this verse and say, Lord, I got my soul. I want to see your ass. As the Father. So you. What is the need of me coming all the way over here and expounding everything I can on the tree of life to you if you're just going to say, well, that was a good video. I was wondering what it's going to have next week. Dear soul, dear soul, dear soul, dear soul. This is God the Father speaking to you through God the Son. Is that of no consequence? Does that not mean anything to us? It ought to mean everything to us. Let us see what God will have for us. Oh, my soul. May I read you a few verses and then we'll close? They're all in the book of Proverbs. This is the only other uh, book where you'll find this tree of life continually mentioned. Genesis, Revelation. But look with me in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Do I? Are you? Is that which I do, that fruit, that result of my actions and words, does it become a tree of life to, any, to anybody? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Chapter 13 of Proverbs and verse number 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the, the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Have you asked God for something and you were grieving so bad and your flesh didn't believe you're going to get it, but your spirit said, I got to keep on praying because the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing, and you kept on praying, and then all of a sudden God gave it to you, and it, it opened up, and it happened. Wow, it's like a tree of life. Don't forget to go back and say thank you. Oftentimes when God answers our hard prayers like that, we're so glad we got it and so relieved from the spirit from the pressure and the stress, we, we get so delighted, we're like the nine lepers, we forget to turn around and thank Jesus for giving it to us. Don't forget. 15 and verse 4. Proverbs 15 and verse 4, and this will be our last one. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein in the tongue is a breach in the spirit. Have you ever heard a merry heart doeth good like a medicine? Yep, that's what this is talking about. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. I'm so tired of the filth that you cannot avoid in this nation now. People talking just with lust and vulgarities and, and, and it's just it's sickening. And to have somebody speak to you in a, a way of, 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 of sanctity or blessedness or wholesomeness, it's a tree of life. It's a refreshing. It's like eating off of a tree with good, delicious, juicy fruit and enjoying it. 
So these are some of the verses in the middle of your Bible in the book of Proverbs that, uh, that are yours. And I, I didn't bring you everything that I had prepared to bring you. I never do. But I tried to follow the Holy Spirit and bring you everything that God seemed, as I could understand, me to want to bring you. We've been educated, we've been illuminated, and now we've been challenged. Friend, make yourself available to the tree of life and read John chapter 6 until you understand what the Lord Jesus is saying to you. Thank you. God bless you. Amen.